shares a common genetic goal, except for a few outliers, the tiny bacteria. In fact. Um, we have four letters. I'm not going to tell you what they represent. It's just A, C, G, T. The DNA is where the specifications are stored in our in the nuclei of our cells, and that gets translated into RNA, which happens to use a different letter instead of a T for a U, but they have a direct correspondence. So anything written in the genome in the form of DNA gets translated into RNA, which then is used by ribosomes to build the proteins. Now, we use we happen to use three-letter words. In fact, if you want to use two-letter words, you would have four words which would be um, only 16 possible amino acids. But it happens that life on Earth uses 20 amino acids and a perpetration mark, which we call a stop codon. Each word is, a, is called a codon. So we have to use three bits. Four, few, that's uh, 64 possible combinations. And in fact, given that we only use 20 amino acids, it means there's a lot of redundancy in the genetic code. For example, triple U over there, and W and C would represent the same amino acid. And such a difference would be invisible to natural selection because that produces exactly the same amino acid in the sequence. In the end, we have exactly the same protein. So these neutral mutations can uh, uh, accumulate differences in the genome. In this case, instead of the genes being different and coding for different proteins, it could still be coding for the same protein, but it's got different letters that we can count the differences. Uh, so to compare the DNA, we would have to firstly align the text. That red is not very visible here, but the point is I've got this bit here. That's the same gene, but I've modified a letter there. That's a G that's switched into a C. That may or may not make a difference on the final organism. But the point is we can actually read these and uh, count the number of differences. So if we count the mutations in each pair between humans and chimps, humans and gorillas, and then gorillas and the chimps, we might be able to come up with a tree that requires the least number of mutations. And it turns out that this tree here is correct. Humans and the chimpanzees have a common ancestor about four million years ago. And humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor with the gorillas six million years ago. And the humans and the chimps are equally related to the gorillas because at this point here, we're both exactly the same species. There was no humans and chimps. It's only four million years ago that we separated from them in Africa, by the way. Now, there's a few problems with this method. It's called the method of parsimony, in fact, because we're using the least number of uh, mutations to explain the differences. Um, if we've got three or four members, it's easy enough. We can draw the trees and try to figure out which one is correct. For five members, you get 15 trees, and it blows up exponentially from there. It gets terribly difficult to do. And we also have a limited alphabet, so A, C, G, T. It's quite likely that a given letter, a G, switched into a C. It could also mutate into a G again at some point in the future. So if you're looking at that change, we're losing, we're losing one mutation, or two actually. Uh, it changed into from a G to a C and then back to a G, so we lost two mutations and didn't realize it. We need alternative methods to parsimony. And one of them is called likelihood analysis, where the length of those branches that I showed you would show the length of time that happens <coughs> in those clippings. And we could try different trees, but if all the trees happen to agree on a given split, that would uh, help us decide that this split was, is really likely to have happened at that time. Uh, quick word on radiometric dating. It's uh, a lot like the, well, actually on the molecular clock, but it's a lot like radiometric dating, where if we're trying to date a piece of uh, wood that, uh, an artifact, an archaeological artifact, 
for a piece of rock. We would use uh, nuclear decay. In fact, if we've got a bunch of 1,000 atoms, we might not know which one of these, the nuclei in which of these atoms is going to decay, but we can predict something using something called the half-life that in, say, five minutes, half of all of these would have decay, in which case we would just have 500 uh, radioactive atoms left. And in another five minutes, half of that would decay. In this case, we use uh, the change, the mutation from the gene. Now, you might think it's entirely random, but it turns out that for any given gene, you can make statistical predictions by reading off uh, the number of mutations on it. And once we have such a such a clock, we can calibrate it against uh, fossils to get the actual date on it, the absolute time that elapsed between us and a given uh, ancestor. So I've told you a bit about natural selection. I hope that makes sense now. But you didn't really know about it. And about the resonant trace. That's what it's called. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.